is a panel of four, including Jeffrey Onegi Obel, a former NSSF board chairperson and economist, Hadija Nanyomo, executive director Ernest and Young, Uganda, Ramadan Gobi, an economics lecturer at MOOBS, and Professor Augustus Nwagawa, an economic transformation expert from Reeve Consult International. Gentlemen and lady, welcome to the show. You are on the spot tonight. We are receiving Professor Augustus. We are receiving conflicting figures about the state of our economy. From the patrons, for example, National Planning Authority, Bank of Uganda, and members of Parliamentary Committee on the Economy. IMF is also giving us varying figures on GDP growth. What is the situation like in your view? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Patrick, and uh, good evening, viewers. Uh, the, 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 the current economy now, as we all know, has been passing through quite uh, a, a lot of hurdles. We have had uh, economic growth uh, ranging between 10.1 uh, in the early 2008-2009 to, to the recent 3.0 in the financial year. 2015-16, uh, the, the, there has been a rebounding of the economy as, as revealed by UBOS, because for us what we believe in is UBOS, which is the Uganda Bureau of Statistics. This is the body mandated to carry out the national uh, household expenditure survey and also determine the, the, the rate of growth of the economy. So the, the institution that we can believe in, which can give us the most authoritative uh, data on, on, on growth is actually UBOS. It is the one which gives us the data on growth, it is the one which gives us the data on poverty, and uh, irrespective of what uh, uh, everyone is saying, uh, we shall believe UBOS, but also as you believe UBOS, it's also good to believe yourself. How do you see it? Uh, is, is what UBOS is saying, is what Bank of Uganda is saying, is what uh, IMF is saying, is what the National Planning Authority is saying, consistent with what is actually in your pocket. That's what is very, very important. And as you can see, uh, sometimes there is a discrepancy between what actually is in your pocket and what the macro economy is saying. And for me, what I've been uh, 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 focus, focusing on and emphasizing is that people need to identify with the growth figures, particularly the macro economy that people are talking about. That's what is most important. Adija, more Ugandans seem to be slipping into poverty with the number of pe people who are poor now growing from 6.6 .6 million from 12 of 2012 of 2013 and, and i'm quoting the uganda national household survey that number has grown to almost 10, 10 million people mm. isn't this an indicator that the economy has shrunk so much um it is, but we need to look at a few things like uh, what are we considering as poverty? Does, is this representative of the entire population we are looking at? How do we compare these levels, what we are talking about in terms of the poor people to the rich? How is the gap spread? And uh, what is government doing? What are the initiatives government is putting in place to support or to improve these poverty levels. So it's a combination of things, but clearly the poverty levels are becoming worrying. And uh, as we see what is going on, everything that is going on in the economy, the very bad stories, they are kind of indicative. And the public is relating everything that is going on, the security concerns, they, they are calling them idol youths. It's all believed to be signs of the increasing and increasing poverty levels. Ramadan, if we had 6.6 .6 million people who are poor in 2012, and now they have increased to 10 million, mm. then we are headed to a very difficult future, near oh, future. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Patrick. Of course, see, we have been talking about poverty and uh, the general performance of the economy. 
in the recent years, as the professor uh, introduced, the economy um, has been going down the train. And the, when you check the figures and you check the on-the-ground realities, they all attest to that, that uh, the economy hasn't been uh, performing quite well. And um, uh, leave alone the GDP growth, because these things of GDP, people don't understand them. Uh, look at uh, the food basket, which we, <laughs> we buy <laughs> every day. And look at uh, the prices of goods and services, which we pay. You know, the inflation, it does not tell the story of the absolute prices, because now inflation is very low, 2%. That's what you both told us uh, uh, this month, last month of uh, of uh, March, the inflation reduced to two. But the prices which we pay on uh, food products, on uh, fuel, on uh, you know, Medicare and so on, they have gone up. So the, the, the challenge of poverty cannot go away when two things happen. When the economy shrinks, stops growing, and two, when people produce more children than, than food. Than, than, than products. <laughs> and this is what has been happening in Uganda. I think uh, we have been more efficient and effective in producing children than in producing goods and services. <laughs> and at the end of the day, you see that uh, uh, much as um, there has been some GDP growth, the growth has been lower than the rate at which uh, the, the people have recreated themselves. And this has caused uh, that kind of increase in Mr. Onegi Abel, Ramadan Gobi is talking about a population growth, which is not in tandem with the GDP growth. Do you believe that's where the problem lies? Uh, first of all, uh, let me correct you, I'm not an economist. Uh, I'm an investment banker, and as you know, my footprint is in the capital markets industry. Yes. Yeah. And uh, we look at things a bit differently. We appreciate the analysis which is always provided by economists, but we look at more the tools which are used to gear up or stabilize the economy. Mm -hmm. That's what we do in finance. Now, along those lines, I would rather uh, look at, uh, uh, instead of looking at uh, the population, I would rather look at what we need to do. We need to grow at a minimum of 8% GDP points per annum, year on year, for at least two cycles of five years. That's what we need to do. And the good news is that we can do it. So for 20 years? Well, 10. Even if you, do it for, if you did it for five years, year on year, say we grew by eight, nine, ten points year on year, without backsliding, then you'd uh, deal with what Ramadan is talking about. What he's talking about is the reality that um, GDP growth in one year is, say, six points. Population growth rate is 3.2. When you extrapolate, you have what we in finance we call jobless growth. Because on a net basis, you're like someone on a treadmill, mm, walking or running very fast, but you're on one, f on one spot. But where we are now, we need to talk about solutions, not uh, the problems, because we have analyzed our problems ad nauseum. We know all our problems, but the solutions are there. If you could guide us to talk about solutions. Okay, well, yes. Professor Gastus, I th one of the solutions, I suppose, would be mm -hmm. this country should be, uh, should be producing something. Yes. Should mm -hmm. be, but what are we producing? Because we must produce food, we must produce industrial uh, products, we must export. Mm. And that maybe could be one of the ways to en enhance the economy. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Patrick and the viewers. Uh, if you look at the, the structure of the economy and uh, the subsectors that are contributing to that growth, even we are talking about, you will discover a lot of discrepancies. And one of them is that the agricultural sector, which basically is the, the most democratically economic sector that should be producing more toward GDP is the one, ironically, which is growing at a much lower rate. It is contributes approximately 23% GDP, but employs almost 80% of the population. What does this tell us? That the, the sector which employs very many people 
is paradoxically the sector which contributes less. And, and, and uh, uh, the corollary is that the telecoms and the banks, the services sector, contributes almost 60% now to GDP. But how many people are employed there? A handful of people. And these mentioned. banks, and these banks are not even indigenous Ugandan. They are not, they are not. The four of them, the, 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 the first, actually the first four, that command almost sixty percent of the total financial assets are foreign banks, and they repatriate all profits. They don't plow back with, uh, uh, these, these profits. So the the, the reason why, uh, the, 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 even if the economy grew, the reason why the, the, the growth does not percolate down, does not uh, is not felt by the ordinary person, is that there the, the is growth which lacks transformation. The, 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 the growth is there at the macro level, but is not trickling down. Why? Because the sectors that are growing are not the ones, are not the sectors that employ the so, so largest number of people. Hadija, how can we have the biggest chunk of Uganda's population contribute the biggest chunk to the, to the GDP? Um, I, I want to also say that I'm a tax expert, and I know I'm a tax professional. Mm. And if I, I link into what Professor is saying, I was, uh, I'm always intrigued or I'm always surprised when the, the, the budget estimates come out and agriculture is at a paltry 3%, 4%, 5%. But we expect to grow and we keep lamenting that our exports are going down and yet we know that our exports would improve if we go into agro-processing and improving our produce. But when it comes to tax, I'm, uh, I'm also intrigued that this year, one of the tax proposals that has come up is to, 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 to allow designated taxpayers who are paying, those who are supplying them agricultural produce, to withhold 10% on their payments. So, so the question I'm seeing is how do we work that backwards? If Professor here is saying that uh, agriculture is still low and we are not getting a lot out of it, so what are we planning to tax on it? is the question. Mm -hmm. So probably we need to go back and look at the drawing board. Can we encourage, can we enhance more produce and more people to go into commercial farming, more exports going out, then we can probably think of taxing the sector as opposed to taxing what may probably not be there. You, you seem to agree that agriculture is what could save Uganda. Uh, Ramadan, mm -hmm. the managers of our economy, don't they see it? They don't like it or they don't get it? Um, good enough, I'm not one of them. <laughs> uh, of course, they, they know what to do. Um, most of them are uh, economists who have uh, at least had the basic classes of economics where they teach us that uh, development starts with the getting the primary sector of the country um, out you know, in terms of revolutionizing it. We call it agricultural revolution. You must complete it. And it has about three major aspects to deal with. The biological transformation, whereby you get people to stop uh, uh, recycling whatever uh, they, they, they learned as kids. You know, they all are recycling seed. We, we plant some beans, we eat some. Then we keep them when the rains come we plant them and we, we harvest, we eat some. You find the beans we are planting today, we are perhaps the same kind of uh, breed which was uh, planted by our grandparents. So there is need for biological transformation of the sector. There's a need for chemical transformation of the sector and mechanical transformation. These have always been talked about and uh, we have debated them like uh, the senior here was talking about, you know, <laughs> perhaps uh, is a completely right. We need to move on, on now emphasizing more the solutions, make more noise mm -hmm. on the solutions such that perhaps these policy makers um, can listen to, to, to some of these ideas m again and again. Perhaps they will get irritated by this noise and they start to implement them. Because one, I think uh, we are making a big mistake of uh, thinking that agriculture is a private sector oriented kind of industry. You, you leave it to the individual. Because in Uganda, we don't have that private sector and agricultural sector. We have peasants. And to transform them, we need to invest heavily in that sector. Mm. In Ethiopia, they are, they are putting 
13% of their GDP, uh, I mean of their budget in the sector. And it is doing miracles there. In countries, all countries have transformed that sector from Korea. If you went to Korea and you read how they did it, China, how they did it. I've been reading a book, How Asia Works. And you see how they transformed the agricultural sector so that they can enter into industry. They put money in the right places in order to propel the productivity levels. That we mean what by productivity? The yield per hectare, the kind of uh, uh, amount of milk you get out of an animal. Here we are still getting five liters from a cow a day. And somewhere they are getting 40 liters from the same cow. So that's the difference. And we, it can't just come on its own. And our policy makers know this. The challenge which has been there, there has been that uh, thing of uh, private sector led, uh, uh, inculcated in people, the neoliberalism, that uh, leave the people out there, they would, do, uh, they would do the farming. Let us invest only in infrastructure to facilitate them. Okay. And I think that's not uh, mm. going Mr. to work. Mr. Onegio Bell, when you look at East Africa, almost half of East Africa's arable land is here in Uganda. And when it comes to water, we are in doubt. When it comes to fertile soils, we are still in doubt, even though maybe it is losi losing its uh, fertility somehow. Can't we get into agriculture in a major way that all the countries surrounding, surrounding us cannot even get into it? Because we have everything it takes for us to outcompete in the border around. Yeah, you're right. Um, first of all, let me say that at the outset that uh, for every economic uh, so-called problem you can name today, someone has solved it somewhere. Yeah. Um, Ramadan was talking about policy. Uh, policy is very important. You mentioned water. What is our policy on water? It's not there. But there are other countries who have water policies. Why can't we just Xerox? So from a solutions perspective, this country is well endowed mm. with everything. But like in private sector, like in business, like even in a, at the household level, you need teams, good teams, individuals in teams who are specialized in every aspect of that. Not everybody, not everyone can do everything. You need teams. So you, you see a problem with the Ugandan team in trying to develop the economy, do you? No, we have always had problems. Like most countries have problems, but degrees, there are degrees of difficulty. What is not very interesting here is that we have difficulties year on year and we send the same teams we try and address them with the same solution which failed last year yeah this is what is uh, terribly frustrating because with the assets which we have with the asset classes we have in this country we can achieve i'm one of those who believe very strongly that we can achieve the middle income um, economy status by by engaging the right economic gears the right economic I'm policy talking, I'm talking about the, 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 time, yeah. the time the time <laughs> huh? because yeah. they had set a deadline the of 2020. 2020. no I, I i told you one does not have to be clever in this yeah? you need to grow by a minimum of eight percentage points per annum year on year for at least five years to Professor get augustus to told us we are growing around 10 per, by 10 percent about Seven, about, seven, eight. about eight years ago, nine years ago, we are now, we have gone down no, instead. No, we did that for a couple of years, I believe, mm. uh, but we didn't, we didn't sustain it. You, yeah. you need to engage the correct gears. It has to be... For quite some time. Yeah, for quite some time. That's, that's why I said, year on year, for at least one cycle of five years, then you are knocking on the door of, of transformation. And one of the key tools for that is domestic savings. You hear... Everybody talking about FDI, FDI, FDI. But nobody talks about domestic direct investment. That's the most important engine of transformation. Mm. Now, when you have uh, very serious people say, 
in broad daylight that Ugandans have a, a poor savings culture, so therefore uh, they cannot generate adequate domestic direct investment is problematic. Because the telecommunication sector has demonstrated very ably that Ugandans have savings, but because uh, our financial services sector, where I come from, is not responsive, people don't keep their money in banks. As I'm talking today, the interest rate signal for savings is negative. How can you have that in the 21st century? How can you punish somebody for putting money in a bank, in a savings account? What justification is there? There is absolutely no justification. How can you have a spread of CBR is nine points now? Yeah. Nine. 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 No, nine. It's nine. Yeah. Then retail interest rates are how much? 25? 24. Okay, let's say 20. Okay. How can you have in the 21st century with very highly educated people, how can you have that <laughs> spread in broad daylight? <laughs> how, how, how many? I mean, isn't that really the modern daylight thuggery? Because the, the, the <laughs> <laughs> after what all of us have been wondering, was the, the central bank has clearly put CBR at nine. nine. Mm -hmm. Remember it was at one point and even on 23. Yes. Mm -hmm. It has come down, come down, and it has not gone back. Mm -hmm. It has consistently come down now it is a nine, but interest rate is still above 20. Now even if you really, because the banks are arguing that most of them will argue that the, the still the, 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 the NPR is high, but the NPR has also gone down. The, the non-performing uh, assets, assets yeah. have gone down to, to, to very, very low levels, but still Operational costs. It's it's that's what they cost, but yeah. they don't yeah. maybe have electricity yeah. generators and the salaries and maybe money being. Even if you added all those. But 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 if you are borrowing at over twenty percent, why can't what? Is it's obvious you are going to have a lot of NPS? Yeah, well, which which tell me which business are you going to, to, to invest in at that uh, rate? Are you if if, if, if I may if I may come in follow up what uh, the professor is saying. Everybody talks about NPL non-performing what what and so on, mm. but all of us know that these banks we have here are commercial banks. Mm. The assets are purely commercial. No development assets, mm. Mm? no investment assets, no long-term assets. So is monetary policy just serving these few banks with very few customers? How many people hold banks? How many accounts are there in the, in the banking system? And the accounts are about, to, about five, five to five, six five million. There. Now, is the entire economy ransom to this Five million account holders. But even if, really? the, if, even if the NPR was high, I yeah. don't think that it should be a justification for that kind of interest rate because yeah. the, 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 the inefficiency of the banks, of the management of the banks, yeah. cannot but be displaced on the... On uh, the uh, Padija, what would be the, the impact the of uh, the government's inside borrowing from, like, we have to go to the same banks and the government is also borrowing from the same banks? Isn't that a, a increasing also maybe the interest rates? Yeah. Definitely, not necessarily the infra interest rates, but the, the, the impact of us, the ordinary people, the businessmen competing with government, mm. is that there will be no, no liquidity in the economy. There is no money for me, because uh, I'm, I'm a single person. Mm. Then the, the rates are also too high. But also what I wanted to comment is that um, I, think, I think the world is evolving so fast, because uh, two years or one year ago, we saw Kenya capping its interest rates and uh, most of the banks 14 .5. to 14.5 mm -hmm. and most of the banks had gone to that as, as, as the maximum. But I, I was reading a report recently that was, uh, was, was reviewing the impact and the impact hasn't still been that good because most of the people, economists, are arguing that they are, they are now looking at an economy that is not liberalized. There is interference in the laws of demand and supply and um, it, it was kind of shunned so <laughs> it, it still hasn't produced the results that are needed so one wonders how does the balance come about we are going to take a break and when we come back i'll be asking whether a bloated public administration is part 
of the problem and what can we do to the team or what does the team need to do? I mean, the team that is running Uganda's economy, what does it need to do to propel us further ahead? We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching On The Spot. My name is Patrick Amara. My guests tonight are Jeffrey Onegi Obel, a banker, Hadija Nanyo, Nanyomo from Aniston Yang, Ramadan Gobi, lecturer at Boobs, and Professor Augustus Nwagaba, an economic transformation expert from Riv Consult International. We're looking at the state of Uganda's economy. Uh, Geoffrey, I have seen the government in the last couple of years emphasizing infrastructure development, and, uh, which I suppose is a good thing. But isn't that also responsible for the economic squeeze we are feeling today? Because I can imagine a lot of money, colossal sums of money, are trapped in there, but that element of local content has not been really taken advantage of by Ugandans so that the money can flow within. Um, no one uh, should have any quarrel about infrastructure development. No one should. Because these are uh, typically medium to long term. And uh, their ROI, their uh, rate of return is, is normally spread out. But the effect of these infrastructures, be they road, rail, and so on, is very, very important to the economy. Because if you don't do that, you pay. You pay, like uh, because we had the bottleneck in planning in roads, we are seeing the results. Traffic jams. People think that uh, when you're in a traffic jam, they don't think about the economic cost of staying in a jam. Mm. Yeah. We do, we calculate it. It's very serious. So no one should have any quarrel about government investing in infrastructure. What we should be talking about is how we price the financing for infrastructure. What instruments do we use to finance infrastructure? You do not finance infrastructure with cash. You pay very dearly. Why? Because cash is the most expensive medium of intermediation. You must use bonds and other such like instruments to, find, to finance uh, uh, infrastructure. Now, once you use bonds, that's when now you can bring in the domestic savings element. If you do it right, ordinary Ugandans can participate in the issuance of bonds and participate in the funding of infrastructure. Because typically, uh, you don't have to be rich to get the, a piece of a bond to finance a railway. Well structured, even 10,000 bob, even 5,000 bob shillings mm. can go into the financing of, a, of infrastructure. But the fascination of cash and the temptation of badly priced loans is always there. That's why policy is always important. What is our policy on bonds? What is our policy on long-term instruments for the financing of infrastructure? It's all there, and I, I repeat, you, we don't have to be clever. Hmm? Uh, Professor Noagaba knows uh, these things are done all over the place. You go to Vietnam, mm. even Russia, <laughs> uh, look at e Ethiopia, yeah. Thailand, e Thailand. Mm. Uh, look at Malaysia. Uh, Ethiopia is doing very well with domestic direct investment. Mm. The only trouble with the uh, domestic di direct investment, it is hard work, but then that's not a problem. It's hard work for policymakers. You, you do not finance uh, infrastructure, long-term infrastructure, uh, with the so-called tax revenues. Yeah. Because tax is recurrent. It is, it is annual. You need to put together long-term finance. For Uganda, we seem to be borrowing. Uh, again, again, uh, there's nothing wrong with borrowing. Yeah. 
borrowing should be like uh, uh, filling in a gap. Hmm? But domestic borrowing, which uh, some people are very scared of, is the right type of money when you borrow domestically. Okay. Rama, Rama Why? Uh, can I finish this one? Yes. Because when you borrow domestically, mm. then it attracts what we call quality FDI. Quality FDI is foreign direct investment, which stays in the country for a long time, uh, which is not a visitor, mm? to take advantage of uh, prices, mm. dis distortions in the economy. It comes here tonight. Call it hot Actually, as we are talking now, it's, it could be arriving, mm. and tomorrow it is gone. <coughs> so, 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 Ramadan, how about the issue of public administration, a bloated public administration that is not producing anything? I, isn't that also sort of, you know, taking away? Mm. Because if, we if you look at our budget, it seems to be more consum con con consumption the budget other than production. Mm -hmm. So what do we need to do in financial year 2018, 2019, for example? Why should the money be put? And actually, we, we've uh, reached a point where we, we are borrowing now to pay salary. You know, uh, I, I had uh, a few weeks ago when uh, the minister said, no, 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 we are not borrowing the whole money for salary, just a little bit of it. <laughs> and I was like, you know, we don't need to borrow even one shilling to pay salary. So um, I think you are right. Uh, we have spoken about this also several times. And uh, the good thing which uh, I heard is that government is considering ways of uh, reforming itself. I don't know whether government can reform itself, but there are efforts to rationalize the government <coughs> from within uh, by looking at the number of agencies that uh, have been coming up, duplicating themselves by looking at uh, uh, public service itself, uh, the civil service, uh, how it has, you know, geometrically grown in the last two decades because it had been, uh, when I these reforms came in the early 90s, the public service had been reduced to about 95,000. Now it's above 310,000 you know, members. Of course the population has grown, but it hasn't grown at such a speed. Of course that means there hasn't been internal control on the way uh, government was planning itself, government was uh, structuring itself. The, there was laissez-faire kind of uh, 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 touch on it. The, the same way we liberalized the economy. You know liberal, uh, liberalism has never been bad. The world over, society is a liberal. But how you do it is the most important thing. For us, when uh, we were told that we can open up our markets, we had that word open up. W we just plucked out the door and threw it away. When we heard that you can liberalize the markets, we thought liberalization is synonymous with the deregulation. You don't have even to regulate. We put in place some regulatory agencies, but they haven't been effective in doing the regulatory work. Some of them got captured by the people they are supposed to regulate. So as a result of that uh, kind of freestyle of doing things, government, uh, I think, became so amorphous. It became quite big. You look at many people concentrate on the politicians Whenever we talk of government, people's minds run to parliament, run to advisors of the president and so. But my dear, when you go down to these people who work in the civil service, there are so many. You go in these offices and they, don't, they have no work to do actually. They're just moving around. That's why you always you see cars on the road moving around, ready numbers. Because people don't have work to do, but they're employed by government. It's good for government because the last resort employer, Uganda has, have, has had a, an employment problem, but such 
a big labor force should be redirected into productive work. And this can be done. Hadija, how can they be, be directed into productive work? Yet, some of these ten, taken constitutions, for example, the, the Bukalasa type, the Busitemas type, and the Kiambogo, most of them have become universities producing, yes, of course, graduates, but we seem to have moved away from uh, giving, skilling Ugandans through uh, technical uh, schools where they can be effective, maybe work in cottage industries and things like that. Haven't we made a mistake Actually, in the training of Ugandans in our institutions? Actually, for me, before we even get to the training, I, I may not have quite a problem with the bloated public administration or the many employees in government, but my issue is around the, the, the planning around it. Mm. A lot of uh, technical input goes in and, and, and you know technocrats really come up with a good strategy of why we may have institution ABC. And when you read and, uh, and, and look at the strategy, the plan, everything, everything is in order. But for me, the who, who is in it? How is it structured? When will it be put to accountability? What is it going to produce? And all that are where I'm seeing a problem. Because it's not a problem to have so many institutions coming together and many of them specializing in where government feels these people are best at this. But the way it is done and the lack of accountability, the, work of proper, the lack of proper governance around them is my biggest issue. If we go back to our days, we, we also did not have a lot of technical, you know, colleges or tertiary. But I, I believe the generation that we are in has come up and has done good for, 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 the, for, the, for, the, for the government or for the populacy. But I think where we are going wrong is more about accountability, implementation and governance. And if those are sorted, probably we may have everything falling into place. Is, isn't there a lot of duplication of roles and duties, Professor? i give an example with all respect. You have Uganda Wildlife Education Center, you have Uganda Wildlife Authority, you have National Forest Authority, you have National Environment Man Management Authority, you have the ministry. I mean, all those things are more or less in one uh, area. Couldn't, couldn't they, that agentification, isn't it a problem? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Patrick. I think the, there are two issues. One, what could have been the reasons for creating such a, uh, apparently similar agencies? And if you look at the way we were uh, privatizing government and also creating these uh, uh, liberal, the, the, the liberal institutions, you may have wanted to say that since the government abolished the mainstream uh, uh, parastatus, as you remember, then there the, the, the could have been possible an effort, that's just, I'm just speculating. There could have been an effort for now saying where do we, I mean, how do we create now employment for these people? And therefore, the, 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 the way these agencies came up, you may want to, to really question how could you have had such a very many agencies almost doing the same thing. But now since that since the, the, the agencies are there, it's like producing many children and now we are talking about population control. You are not going to cure the children. <laughs> so the only thing you are going to, to, to do is how can we uh, make these institutions <laughs> efficient and how can you rationalize them without hurting now the, 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 the yeah. because we are talking about employment. So one is that many, what many countries are doing, uh, what is happening in Vietnam, what is happening in somebody has been mentioning Ethiopia, what is happening in Thailand, these countries which we know, is that they, they are employing technology now. Most of this work which you see people doing here in these situations is, is really done uh, through technology, even agriculture. And of course, the efficiency created transforms now these populations which are engaged there, some higher level. So you have now primary sectors where agriculture is, is, is largely dominating the economy. That one is going into the, the, the production sector. But the way they have been production sector, they're going to the tertiary sectors. Those are, those are now going to information and then the financial sectors. This, this has actually happened in Mauritius. Mauritius is the best country which has demonstrated this, that people can move from primary sectors to, to production, to tertiary, to knowledge-based sectors yes. now. And this is very good because uh, it, 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 well, it, it, it produces people, it churns out people, but who are going to doubt now be involved in a higher 
sector and the higher sector where they are going mm. is actually more productive than the sector where they, where they have been. Mm. So if what has China done, uh, China has brought from Germany and China has said uh, if people are in education system the way we, we, we have been educating our people is that even Patrick, you know you, you also, you, 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 you don't pride in your son or daughter going to polytechnic. I know it. People here do not want their children to go to polytechnic schools, to technical schools, to vocational schools. So what I'm advising government, what I've been advising governments, most of them, and also let me repeat it here, what I'm advising the Ugandan government is to, to, to have what you call a dual qualification framework. So that if Makerere University, somebody has graduated in economics, th th that kind of person which can go to another place where it is mandatory. Actually, we, should, we better even have it before. So that when you finish senior six, the uh, higher advanced education certificate, people should not go to Makerere or to another university before they can go to like take one year to where they can get a skill. And this is what happens in China. And that's why China is going to, to, to colonize now everyone. Everybody in China can produce, everybody in China has a skill, everybody is engaged in the production, everybody engaged in income generation. Why? Because the person has human capital, the person is productive, the person has those capabilities, he has acquired them by, which is mandatory. That's what the country does, and this is the thing that we should do. Mr. Nagabel, is that what would happen, would, would solve the problem for our, gen, our jobless generation of young Ugandans? Patrick, there are two key uh, indicators, global indicators, which all countries must watch. The first one is the interest rate, which we call the key price in the economy. Mm. The second one is jobs. The interest rate regime must target jobs, not necessarily inflation. Hmm? Mm -hmm. It must target jobs directly. Um, once it does that, all other variables in the economy <laughs> uh, follow suit. Then on top of that, you add the planning function. Now, you don't plan for the short term. You plan for very long term. These are things, these are uh, what we now know uh, after... Uh, 30, 40 years of experimentation with neoliberalism, uh, whose um, even the authors themselves of neoliberalism have now debunked. Conceded. Yeah? Mm. yeah? They have conceded. Mm. Some have even the written books. Yeah. yeah, the professor knows, knows, knows them. But, yeah. but uh, I'm sorry to say we are still insisting yeah. when the authors themselves have debunked it. Let me go back. The interest rate as the key price in the economy, is the most important economic signal. Managing it means you succeed or fail. But fortunately, other regimes, other countries have shown us the way. So if you follow what is prevailing in other jurisdictions, similar jurisdictions, you cannot fail. The other one is jobs. I, I concur with my sister here. It is not, the issue is not uh, a bloated uh, public service is what are they doing? Mm. That's it what it is it what are mm. they, they doing? Don't have uh, what to do. Had <laughs> we grown <laughs> consistently uh, by the rates which I've mentioned uh, uh, for the last 10 years, year on year, I would be looking at a public service, I believe, of about 800,000 per million. Now, public servants, as you probably know, they are, they are a special breed. Not everybody can be a public servant. Yeah. Uh, I'm bringing this up because um, it seems we are in a situation where uh, it's, it's about jobs, not about what your output is, not about what you can contribute. If you rewind back uh, there was a time when public servants were public servants, as they say. They had public houses, they had what? They had very, uh, what appeared to be meager salaries, but they had public housing. Now, their homes were sold, but were not replaced. 
So we now acquired a different type of public servant mm -hmm. hmm? who needed uh, a different type of compensation. I'm being very deliberate here. A different type of public servants who needed a different type of compensation. And he had a different attitude. Bottom line is we do not have a public servant now. Okay. Mm. Gentlemen and lady, we are going to take a break. When we come back, I'll be asking, is our current public debt and more uptake of it sustainable? We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching On The Spot. My name is Patrick Amara. My guests tonight are Geoffrey Onegi Obel, a banker, Ramadan Gobi, lecturer at MOOBS, Hadija Nanyomo, executive director, Ernest and Young, and Professor Gustas Nwagaba, an economic transformation expert from Rive Consult International. And we're looking at the state of Uganda's economy. Before we went to break, I wanted to know, is our current public debt and more uptake of the same sustainable professor? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Patrick. Our, our current debt, which we can put in two, two categories, uh, is the such that the, the falling debt, the, the, the money we have borrowed in hard currency to, to GDP is, is, is quite high because we have borrowed for Karuma, 1.7 billion, we have borrowed for uh, gold, because all these dams, all these road infrastructure. All these, uh, and we are still borrowing, we need money also for oil roads. Is that the, the debt to GDP is approximately 33% of GDP, which, according to Fitch and other uh, agencies that measure uh, the, the, the worthiness of the debt and the, the level of GDP, is that we are still not very bad. We are actually still not very bad in terms of the, because the threshold is about 50%, we are towards 33, 38%. So you can actually say that, that the, the threshold is still not very bad, but what matters in, in, in issues of debt is that what are you using that debt for? It's like you at home, if you are borrowing money to finish up your apartments, so that people can enter the apartments and you pay the bank, that, that kind of debt is very progressive debt. But if you borrow to have the wedding or you give off your daughter, then you are really in trouble. Then the secondly, is that, of course, now most of the, the, the money we are contracting is for infrastructure. And no one, no one can really dispute the, the importance of infrastructure given the infrastructure deficit that we have been having. So the, the, the need for borrowing, the only uh, trouble we have had, of course, is the participation of domestic uh, uh, of, 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 of the Ugandans, the indigenous population in this local content. And, 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 and if you can see the, um, the number of projects that have been uh, contracted, if we partook of these uh, uh, contracts, then our growth should have, have benefited the Ugandans. Then lastly, the, the issue of, of domestic borrowing, uh, which I think uh, Adija alluded to. The issue of domestic borrowing is such that if government borrows heavily as as we have seen you compete with the private sector actually you crowd out the private sector and if you go to the bank and you also want to borrow of course there is no money in the bank the bank is going to say professor you are too risky i better lend go with the government. government because for me more risky than, than riskier than than government so you you crowd out the the the, the, the private sector and also it drives now interest rate very high Actually, this is one of the, the major drivers of, of interest rates. So it is, it is very uh, 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 sensitive that the government continues borrowing. You must borrow when you can use that money very well in terms of infrastructure and other productive activities. And two, it is important that domestic debt is actually paid. Because if you continue uh, crowding out the private sector and also competing with them, you drive interest rate very high. And so you stiff for business because actually, mo actually most of the, the causes of growth uh, from 10.1 to 8.66 to, to 3.2 the other year was actually because of lack of, of these domestic also areas. Okay. Lack of uh, business, Hadija, local business uh, I'm told in financial year uh, 2018, the budget 2018-2019, the second biggest uh, item in that budget is debt servicing. Is that healthy? 
um, actually, when I look at the budget allocations for government, uh, I think debt financing has also become a sector. And I don't know what kind of sector that, that is going to cover, but it's, it's key in the sectors. It comes as number two, as it the comes biggest sector. as number two. two. Mm -hmm. And me as a I'm peasant who sits on my small farm and maybe I need water for irrigation, I need this road to, to access another area, it, 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 it's, it's, it really saddens me because, like uh, Professor has said, we, we need to get that debt and use it, and all of us, even up to the smallest level of, of an ordinary person, we can see that that debt has actually been put to good use. But if we are going to, 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 to bring in the debt, mismanage it, not put people to accountability in some areas where we are so lucky we've managed it, the, the uptake or the usage level of even those roads or the dams or whatever, or we're having surplus electricity, all those when you put them together, they kind of exacerbate the, the, the issue we are seeing. So uh, I, I concur with the professor that um, it's, it's, it's really not healthy. We need to go back to the drawing board and be deliberate and think and look at what we are going to achieve out of that debt and how to negotiate better for it. Ramadan, considering the fact that in the borrowing, we are just beginning. If you look at the projects that are coming up, for example, the Hoima Airport, for example, the refinery, for example, the oil pipeline from Hoima to Tanga in Tanzania, the, 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 the SGR, and all these things. If we borrow money for those projects, then in subsequent budgets, I suppose, debt servicing probably is going to be number one item on our budget, isn't it? Oh, yeah. The, the data is becoming... Uh, a very touchy issue now in Uganda because for four years I think now we got this uh, uh, trick called debt rollover. As the debt is about to mature, especially these short term debts we get domestically, uh, we, we repurchase it and uh, roll it over. And uh, this is similar almost to Ponzi, <laughs> it's like a Ponzi game. <laughs> You know, with the Ponzi, you get uh, someone who uh, has borrowed money and as he's about to, 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 to pay, he realizes he doesn't have money, then he borrows elsewhere to pay the old debt. And uh, this problem is, uh, is becoming, you know, a very big concern to people. Uh, recently, we've seen a, a few people who have calculated our, our debt ability and uh, they are showing that uh, by the year 2050, actually the date which we have already acquired, we shall be uh, not in a position even to pay it off. So we shall have to roll it over for another 40 years, perhaps, for us to be able to pay. But uh, one kind of uh, uh, maybe thing you can read into it, a good thing, is that uh, most of this debt has gone into um, longer term projects has been invested in uh, infrastructure and uh, uh, this infrastructure they, they are likely to bring returns in the future and uh, you know when we are looking at uh, such projects we don't look at these guys the, the NPVs <laughs> the financial analysis of mm -hmm. projects you want the economic analysis a broader one we want to look at the shadow kind of prices and the shadow returns of these projects in terms of welfare of people. You know, sometimes uh, I hear some of my colleagues, uh, when we are discussing these issues, we want to look at the, 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 the return on investment by, by looking at the NPVs mm. and the return rate of return. I, I don't think that's a, a very advisable way of looking at long-term projects. We need to consider, for example, the k kind of lives which are going to be saved by these roads. <laughs> Just you know, having good roads and uh, you take someone to hospital quickly, even if you haven't made a lot of money out of it. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen some Ugandans there on roads which there are no cars and they are brand new. They are there taking selfies uh, in the middle of the road. Some are sleeping. <laughs> others. Uh, or even drying cassava, at least. Uh, or drying, they are serious. Uh, and uh, when you look at those things, some people 
can call it a wastage, that we wasted money by putting it. I, I don't think uh, that's a wastage. But we need to be very careful now with our public investment management. The efficiency we put in, for example, how do we cost these infrastructures? When uh, you hear that some of our roads are the most expensive per unit cost in the world or within the region, that's not good news. Then the delay in implementation of these projects. Sometimes we borrow this money and we put it in, a, in the bank mm. and we, we, we haven't yet even carried out a feasibility study. <laughs> then that's when we start. And I think those mistakes, we have talked about them and the government, if it is listening, is bound to respond by ensuring uh, adequate public investment management of these projects. Mr. Onega Bell, I understand the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam that is being built on the Nile is supposed to produce for them about 6,000 yeah, megawatts yeah, of power at a cost of about $5 billion or four, four to $5 billion. The dam on the Nile, which is going to give us 600, is costing us almost $2 billion. And, and yet, almost half of the money the Ethiopians are going to use to produce 6,000, we are producing 600. Why do we always, you think we always get some kind of a road deal? Um, Patrick, uh, uh, I'll just give you an example. Um, um, it's quite normal for governments elsewhere when they're negotiating contracts. They hire people from Ansen Young, <laughs> PwC, to pretend that they are public servants at the negotiations. Mm. Yeah? It's, it's done. And once the other side yeah, see the, the metro of these hired people, yeah, they get real, as they say. Now, Ethiopians have uh, the ability to do that. Sometimes they bring in their own citizens who are working uh, in the diaspora to do these negotiations for them. And uh, it's a no-brainer that they get better deals. You have to have a certain attitude as a public servant to drive uh, the best deal for your country. Yeah. Um, that example you have given is a, is a classic. Mm. Mm. The Ethiopians do not take prisoners when it comes to Infrastructure. I could have added yeah. that the Ethiopian money is locally resource, sourced. Oh, is that that is true. Yes. It is. It is domestic. The, the, yes. the, yeah. It is listed. domestic. It is domestic. Yeah, they mm. have also a big chunk of yeah. Chinese money, but mm. uh, as well they have money. I'll money give an example of what the, the Ethiopians do. Okay, you are giving us uh, uh, these specifications of uh, wagon trains. Mm. Uh, okay, uh, we are going to make the dashboard. We are going to make the uh, the body. Mm? Mm. You can supply the engine. Yeah. Do you agree? They put the pen like this. You have to agree. Otherwise, they're not going to sign. Mm. Yeah? I've just given you an example. In South Africa, uh, when the South African people are, are negotiating, negotiating aircraft, yeah? remember there was a negotiation like that. They also insisted that, okay, we are going to make the, the uh, was it the engine or something? in South Africa, then you supply us the, mm, the, the body and they hang the pen like this and say, you agree or you don't agree? They sign. So it's attitude, it's leadership, yeah? it's what you do as a public servant negotiating for a public good. Yeah? It's done every, ev everywhere. So uh, this debt this debt issue in negotiations, you, you are borrowing uh, and there's a premium uh, which cannot be explained on top of that. Mm. Uh, it happens. It happens. But it is not a deal killer. For me, I'm not uh, one of those who, ask, who is scared about the, the debt ratio in, 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 in Uganda because our potential for revenue is far much higher. But that potential has mm. not been 
tapped into. <laughs> we, we are collecting about 13 trillion. Our debt, uh, I think, but now is about 38 trillion. We have a saying in uh, in Jonam in, in Pakwachi. If you want to catch fish, eh, a good catch, don't go out with an old net eh, or <laughs> a porous <laughs> eh, uh, net. Yeah, make sure your net is well uh, repaired. Mm. Any holes there you have patched, then go. If you have not uh, patched up the holes and so on, you'll get a poor catch. So maybe these measures of trying taxation, maybe th those are the ones that could work? Is that the, the no, better? No, sure, the point, <laughs> the is point the I'm making is that, <laughs> is that all of us know on this table that the best form of taxation, even from by biblical times, is indirect taxation. Mm. It is not direct mm. taxation. Mm. Yeah? All of us know that. Mm. Why are we so much focused on direct taxation? The reason it is, is we, yeah, it is courage, mm. and it is simpler. Mm. Yeah, it, it is harder work, but more rewarding yeah, to go after indirect mm. taxes. But in a, you know, uh, senior mm. in a yes. poor societies, mm. indirect taxes are quite terrible. They are regressive. Mm. You end up taxing a lot the low-income guys, and you leave out the big ones. That's why sometimes uh, they encourage you that you have. A, a great well, mix. All of us, most so of us are very low. Because now, with the VAT, <laughs> for example, you will get them. You will get everybody to buy sugar and get 18%. But uh, that old man in Chenjojo. That's my home district, by the way. <laughs> I, 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 I chose it deliberately. <laughs> who has only 5,000 shillings to buy a kilo is going to pay the same tax as Mr. Sudir Rupari, mm, the, same. the richest same. Ugandan. Mm. But then? And then, you find that, at the end of the day, government goes to Mr. Sudir, who has uh, expressed interest in investing in a certain area, and they say, we are giving you a tax break. Mm. Uh, can I respond to that mm. very quickly? And yes, yes, yes. Mm. Thank you. Now, mm. this inequality mm. we see in Uganda today is because we are using certain measures which work in an ideal society, in our own unique society. We need sometimes to identify those with the money. Let us be like uh, Willie Sutton. Go for them. Willie Sutton used to rob banks. I, I, I talk about a lot uh, about that man. He used to rob banks. They asked him, why do you rob banks? He said, because that's where money is. We need also to go for those with the money sometimes not necessarily to rely on, on these indirect taxes. But then... Okay, Hadija. <laughs> I, I know the tax experts will disagree, <laughs> <laughs> but I am bringing the economics you know, also, which works. Just to go works. back to the basics, mm. there, there, there are canons of, of taxation. It's supposed to be fair, it's Thank supposed you. to yeah. be equal, mm. it's yeah. supposed to be simplistic, mm. convenient. it's supposed mm. to be convenient. Mm. So it's not about who is rich, who is poor, mm. but it's about every other person paying their fair piece of tax. The waiver the whole day and the exemption so, is, not, so is not fair. In a way, there they, they are a few issues around there, but, but overall, when you look at Uganda, we have the potential. We really have the potential. But Correct. the question is, how many of us are actually yeah, paying pay. tax? Mm. And how many of us are outside the, the tax bracket? And when the revenue measures come up, are they targeting those people out or already inside? Okay. So I think that's Professor, where we need to Professor Gustas, what do we need to do to reboot this economy? And I'll be opening the lines so that you two at home, you can call us and tell us what you think if you have a solution for Uganda's economy. Maybe those who are managing, they can hear something from you and you could add value to our country. How do we reboot? Yeah, <coughs> thank you very much. We, say we have all agreed that the, the structure of the economy is upside down the people who are contributing to the economy in terms of employment are not the ones who are earning sufficiently from it. So the first thing to do is to really revamp the agricultural sector. Something must be done in the agricultural sector in terms of land, streamlining, in terms of, of smallholder to commercial and uh, farming, in terms of productivity of the land and also organization of, 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 of agriculture itself. Because the agriculture is a sector which is 
uh, which is amorphous. It is the, the real problem in our current sector is actually is organization. Because if you look at the operational wealth creation, a lot of money has gone into it. It is definitely not money. Because a lot of money has gone into it, but still you don't see any change. So we need organization, we need financing, we need insurance, we need productivity, and then changing from smallholder to, to, to high productive uh, uh, sectors, some social some sectors within the agricultural sector. Then two, you need jobs. We need to, people, people must have jobs. People must be gainfully employed. And this must take place in terms of creating cap capabilities of people, those who are in the education system and those who are not. Such that you support people who are in the dual carry, people who are in the world, people who are in the formal sector. And what URA can do immediately is to, to, to ensure that also, as we say in the Chigaru Nyankwari, to our community, you release. You cannot milk a cow. You are not feeding. Okay. So the, the, there is a need to inject in if you want to, to, to get out. Let me let me hear what you let out. us hear what Ugandans are saying tonight on this issue. Maybe they have a solution or, or two. Maybe they could agree with, with us or not. I have a call online. Hello. Hello. No no no. Um, um you have uh, you have left your, t your, your monitor and the, the audio is so high, so you need to turn down so that there's a thing in echo. Let me pick another call online. Hello. Hello. Yes, good evening, sir. What's your name and where are you calling from? Uh, this is Colin calling from Masindi. Masindi, you're on air, sir. I want to thank you so much, uh, my brother. You're welcome. The topic on economics is very good and I would like to thank NTV at least once in a month always host the professor and the dear doctor to talk about the economics of our country. Most times, TV stations give us a lot of politics, politicians. We have decided mm. to go for substance really and live form. Mm. As far as I'm concerned, we are getting into substance. Mm. All right, go for it, mm. uh, our caller from Masindi. Uh, if you have a contribution, tell us what you want to say, but we appreciate your comment. Thank you so much. That is all what I wanted to say. Thank oh, you thank, so you. Much. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank, <laughs> you. Very, yeah. thank you very much. Mm. Okay. Uh, let me pick another caller online. I have a caller. Hello. Hello. May, may, I, may I give some guidance here? If, uh, the call, if you, I pick your call, please turn down the volume. That will not give us uh, an echo. We shall have a healthy conversation if you turn down the volume. I have another call online. Hello. Hello. Good evening, sir. What's your name and where are you calling from? Uh, my name is Gordon Sentiba, calling from Ntinda. Calling from? Ntinda. Ntinda, you're on air, sir. Yes. Uh, I want to expand a little bit on what uh, Mr. Nego Bell is talking about. Okay. I know he has been a little bit uh, not so aggressive tonight. The question of local long-term savings mobilization mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is too key to fundamental for this country. The whole country has only 9 trillion local long-term funds in the system. It has half a billion medium-term medium funds in the system. You know, you cannot have this country developing at such low levels of medium to long term financing in the system. And there is no shortcut. We must have local long term forced savings mobilization. And that's why we are calling for the immediate reform of National Social Security Fund. Mm -hmm. We are calling for the immediate the change in the uh, public service uh, pension schemes from a pay as you go scheme to a contributory scheme. So that we can have immediate movement in terms of uh, local long-term finance mobilization for this country. If we don't do that, whatever you are talking about there, we are wasting a lot of time. Because without money, even I had somebody talking about, uh, mob, 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 I mean, lending borrow, local uh, local uh, borrowing from the domestic uh, markets. 
That's what it, ha- it has to happen. But the problem is that there is no money. Mm-hmm. You talk of banks, mm-hmm. commercial banks are only holding short-term funds. Mm-hmm. You cannot borrow short-term funds to finance mm-hmm. long-term mm-hmm. projects. Mm-hmm. Okay. This is where the crisis is. And uh, <laughs> without pushing that we must have the National Security Fund reform, like we have done with the LGBT change, as quickly as possible to have this thing set out, and also to have the reform to move away from the pay-as-you-go system, pension scheme for the government employees, the contributory scheme, so that we can, we can set the two important platforms. Okay. Mm. Thank you very much. Sir. You've made your point and the point is taken. Let me just maybe take two more and then my panelists will respond as we conclude. I have another caller online. Hello. Hello, Hello sir. Hello? Yes, good evening, sir. Yeah, good evening. Thank you so much. What's your name and where are you calling from? I'm calling from this side of Munyonyo. Munyonyo, you're on air. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. My, my, my biggest thing I think is to look at what really exists before they removed all the things that were there initially. That they are winds are put it into progress. Uh, the line, I'm sorry, my brother, your line is not very okay, and uh, so I'm sorry I have to cut that line, and I have to take another caller. Hello? Hello? Yes, uh, Bona Kamara. Good evening, sir. What's your name, and where are you Good calling Good evening, from? sir. My name is Kelly. Now, just a quick one. Yes. Uh, I, I would like to ask this gentleman there, and... Uh, they touched on it. I don't see any country that has developed with such high interest rates. You know, the thing mm. is simple. It's the, I mean, that is the cause because you need money to invest. Now, you can't borrow money at such high interest rates and then make, you know. Now, let me, let me share something little. You see, in South Africa, they actually, the, the central bank used to reduce and the commercial banks were not. And they sort of discovered they were colluding. And there was a big case. You know, they took them to court. This country needs to investigate thoroughly. Is there collusion? Mm. Otherwise, they, you, you cannot. Now, on the other thing, on the, on the point of uh, 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 agriculture, and not only agriculture, I mean, yes. so many other things. You know, we need technology. But now we need to ask a big question. How does a country get technology? We need to borrow. Again, if you look at these countries, what they did in courts, they sent their people and I don't want to use the word, but for, you know, want of it, they, they sort of stole the technology. You know, it's there. There is, there is technology outside there. We don't need to, to reinvent it. So what we need to do, government, like, like there's this fund, what is it called? Uh, innovation fund and all this, science mm-hmm. fund. What they need to do, they could go and purchase this equipment from China, from UK, from whatever. Get them here and then get our people to copy. As simple as that. All right. We shall move. We shall have the technology that we need. Because you see, it is very expensive. If you look at the thing, if you continue importing, it's very expensive. But if you bring it here, you will spar. I mean, you'll have your, your, your scientists here to copy. And then they already these guys in Kiseni copy. You know these trucks that bring the food here? Mm-hmm. If you go, these, these, these guys who are not educated, you know they make spare parts, but you know they copy. If you look at a truck which was meant to carry 20 tons, you, oh, sorry, sorry, 10 tons, it's carrying 25, you know it is reinforced with stuff that is here. Not even the Japanese can, you know, accept that it can do that. But Local knowledge. Mm, local th- th- knowledge. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> uh, um, okay, uh, thank you very much for your contributions. And uh, Professor Gustas, what's going to be your concluding remark on the show tonight? <coughs> Thank you very much. Is that the, the, there is a need for attitude change, particularly in creation of savings. Because even if we are talking about any kind of transformation, we need savings. We need to improve our, our, our courage of saving to know that you do not you are not owed by anyone. Nobody owes a living, nobody owes a lift, nobody owes. What we need is development must be initiated from within and then it can be prepared from outside. All right. Mm. Hadija. I'm very optimistic and I'm a strong believer that we have the potential to achieve anything we can achieve. 
we just need to go back to the drawing board. Let's reflect. Let's put systems in place. Let's be patriotic. And then I think we shall achieve all that we need to achieve in whichever years. Thank you. Ramadan. I think um, we need to rethink the economic model that we chose to manage our country. I think in the 21st century it's not acceptable for us to continue following the Washington consensus as our blueprint. We need to go back <coughs> and retrace industrial policy. Policies which can uh, generate structural change. And to this, we need to get the state directly engaging in investment, in mobilization of savings, in ensuring that uh, we can get money to invest in industry, particularly manufacturing. That's the only way we can create productive, decent jobs and also productivity that mm. can transform Uganda. Mr. Nagyobel. Yes, it's, it's all about uh, interest <coughs> rates and, uh, and jobs. <coughs> and also agree with the uh, colleagues here that the way forward is in policy reform. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no way out of policy reform. And uh, that, policy, that policy reform, the package of policy reforms, must be directed at domestic direct investment. Ugandans have never been against even mandatory savings. Uganda is not against mandatory savings mm. at all. So where is the policy signal which we need um, to send to Ugandans so that they can participate in a brand new mandatory savings regime which is robust, which targets domestic direct investment, which in turn will bring us quality FDI. Thank you very much. If I can pick from a panelist, the few things they've said is policy reform, remodeling, working for, for your country to be patriotic, and this economy can be rebooted. Maybe I may emphasize the words of Hadija are very uh, optimistic that as a country, for her, she says, we shall get there. Ugandans, we shall get there. Mm -hmm. Good night and good bless Uganda. Thank you very much. <laughs>